Okay, um, we're going to start now. Um, my name is Mahendra Mahay. I'm a, uh, the project manager of a project called Dev CSI, Developer Community Sporting Innovation. Um, we've uh, been organizing um, the Developer Challenge at Open Repositories. Um, we've, I, my, I myself have organized the last three. Um, my project's um, funded by an organization called JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee, which is based in the UK. Um, so we've had, f uh, this is the fifth developer challenge. Um, this has been um, the record year. We've had most number of entries ever. Uh, we had 28, okay? Uh, we've had to whittle them down a little bit because um, we've only got about an hour. So we ha we've got uh, the final 19 presentations, okay? Each of them are going to get three minutes to present because they haven't got long and we'll be quite brutal and cut them off. A couple of things. Um, have you all got a voting slip? If you haven't got one, okay, while the presentations are going on, we'll, we'll hand them out, okay? Have you all got pens? Okay, we've got some spare pens, but if you could get some pens out, okay? Okay, yeah, using the best technology. Um, Sorry, a voting slip is just a piece of paper, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Joss. If you have a piece of paper, you can use that, okay? Tear the corner off a piece of, your, of, uh, of a program or something. Um, and uh, what we're going to do with the voting, okay, there's the, the decision process is going to be uh, in two ways, okay? Um, we have a panel of esteemed judges sitting at the front here, okay? <laughs> um, and... Uh, what we're going to do is, at the end of all the presentations, uh, can you all hear me, by the way, at the back? Okay, sorry, yeah. Um, at the end of all the presentations, we're going to bring up a table with all the entries there, and they'll have a number against them. So all you have to do to vote is write the number of your, most f your favorite pitch, okay? That's all you have to do. There's a, one issue, if it's between a six and a nine, can you please put a line underneath? to indicate, because we have to kind of, we'll have to sort them out afterwards. So if it's, a, if it's number six or number nine, uh, please be careful with that. Um, what's going to happen is uh, the, um, we will take the vo votes in, we'll collate them. Um, the judges won't know what your votes are, okay? They're going to uh, uh, convene and decide on their, their, ent the, their entries, that their, their favorite entries, and then I will reveal uh, your votes, and then we'll see if the judges agree, okay? And then there will have to be some decision process. Um, <laughs> um, sorry? Um, the prizes, okay. Um, so the, um, the prizes are, they, the, the overall prize is, uh, and the runners-up share a uh, 1,000 pounds, okay? Uh, it's going to be through Amazon vouchers. Uh, the winning entry, what we will do is we will fund that team. If it's one person, this might be difficult, okay? We'll fund them to get together for two days to actually develop the solution, okay? Which, whichever that is. So they'll, they'll have two days. It may, that depends on logistics. I'm just going to say that just in case they're all dispersed around the world. Um, and there's all, uh, the, the, the challenge has also been kindly sponsored by Microsoft Research, and they have a special prize of a .NET gadgeteer for the, the entry that uses a mi Microsoft technology in their solution, and there are, there are a few of those. Um, that entry can also go to, to the main challenge as well. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to um, start. Um, first, oh yes, we need to do a calibration. Uh, last year at, in Austin, we had a clapometer which was made of paper. We've gone high tech this year. Um, We've got an iPad, okay? <laughs> uh, we want to do a, a quick calibration test, okay? So we want to hear what moderate clapping sounds like. So could we hear a moderate clapping, please? <laughs> okay, and now a crazy enthusiastic clapping, please. <laughs> okay. okay, so... The developers have been working really hard, okay, um, for the last two days. 
Okay, so we, we want to give them as much encouragement as possible. We want to make this as much fun as possible. So we really want your engagement as well. Okay, so I'm going to start first with uh, Matt Taylor from the University of Southampton. And Matt's presentation, uh, his pitch is called Splinter. You just did my first slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Cool. How do I skip that? Uh, just go use a down button. The bottom one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Hello. Ah, cool. Oh, we won't get the audio. We need to have this. Sorry. Nice. Yeah. Have both. Can you hold this? Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Okay. Is we've got a we've got a, a phone thing. No, I was joking with the face. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. As Mahendra mentioned, my name is Matt Taylor. I'm University of Southampton. I'm going to be proposing my idea for the dev challenge, which I call Splinter. I have a funky tagline, Renegade Repositories on Demand, but I probably won't refer to that again. Right. Oh. Okay, so what is Splinter? Splinter is basically a system which allows you to make a temporary offshoot from your main repository. These kind of uh, splinter cell repositories act on behalf of your main repository, but are basically functionally independent. These can later be deleted if they're rubbish or reabsorbed into the main uh, repository at a later date. This makes them ideal for events such as conferences or workshops, where you have a high number of either new, inexperienced, or untrusted uh, contributors, but you still want them to develop and contribute to your repository in some way. Now, the main appeal for this one is it reduces the overhead on behalf of the administrator of the uh, repository in that they no longer have to worry about any of the above factors or even make accounts for any of the people who are going to be joining their repository. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Cool. Okay, so how is, Splinter, how is Splinter implemented? Basically, it's what I call a network of personal micro-repositories. So what is a micro-repository? I like to think of it as a lightweight standalone annotation system, which basically is a bit like a repository in many ways in terms of usage, but cut back on all the features that would confuse new users. Importantly, it's independent to the main repository. And this has many advantages in that any users that maybe aren't very good at making resources, not very experienced in uploading, you don't have to worry about what they're going to be doing with your files. If you're a prestigious institution, and you're having a workshop to try and attract new users to your repository, for example. You don't have to worry about that. You can just put them on this side repository and everything will go fine. No one will worry about it. At the same time, it's a pseudo personal workspace in that while it's invisible in the main repository, it's actually publicly visible. And this is a system I haven't really seen supported that much in repositories. The idea that you can have a private area but it's still available for anyone who wants to see it. The other main advantage of uh, using a micro repository is that you can use a simplified workflow. This will stop people from being afraid if they've not used repository software before, but also allow you to make savings in terms of metadata. For example, if you make, uh, sorry, if you make a, <laughs> a splinter repository for a purpose, such as an event, you can use contextual information from the event to fill in fields automatically, such as you know, the conference date, for example, or even where it is, what it was. And that will let you simplify the workflow a bit more for them. It also, you kidding? <laughs> wow. I overestimated the amount of time I had. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to go with camera. You already do it. I, wow. OK, the bar acquired technologies for this system already exist. We developed a micro repository at Southampton called Redfeather. You can visit the URL. I've made a proof of concept of spawning these, well, Patrick did. It will be available for viewing in the Bazaar Workshop tomorrow. And reabsorption of the repositories, if they're good, is trivial using Sword. No worries. Uh, 
Yarrakis. Okay, so uh, now I'd like to introduce Keith Gilbertson and Linda Newman. And uh, their idea is called Mats. And they'll explain what that is. Let me just switch off my music. Okay. Um, it's there. Okay, thank you. Um, there you go. So, yeah, yeah. So one of you needs to break the time. Okay, we're Matt's, the mobile audio transmission and submission um, idea, and we're a phone application that um, records, transcribes, and submits media files um, to a repository. So there's a simple one-time setup. You just put in your repository and authentic authentication details. The app saves them for you. Um, and again, it records, transcribes, submits. We're going to skip record and just go right to transcribe. Uh, you select your media for transcription, and then on the next screen, um, you enter very simple metadata to describe the item. There's a bar for review up there if you want to review the audio to remind yourself of what it is. And then you select which transcription service you want to use. There's two. Um, Microsoft Research is Mavis, which is a computerized transcription service that can also do subtitles. Um, and then there's Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a humanized transcription service. Um, after you get the transcription back, you can submit the media to repository. So you select the media again, and you select if you want to submit the original recording, the transcript, or both. And even if the transcript hasn't come back from the transcribing service yet, you can still submit it and select it because um, the new SWORD protocol will be able to do updates. So the reason we think that this is possible is because we're stealing most of the code from another application that was submitted last year to the challenge. <laughs> and all of the other pieces already exist, um, too. Use studies. The Digital Archive of Literacy Narratives seeks personal recorded studies of how one learned to read, write, and compose from everyday citizens. Instructions for uploading MP3s today are multi-stepped. The Elliston Poetry Curator at the University of Cincinnati has been hosting noted poets and making analog recordings for decades, still doing so. It would be great for him to have a digital method that would not be multi-stepped and would not require multiple devices. Use study, tablets in the field. Researchers are using mobile devices in the field. The ability to upload an audio or video file at the point of creation with transcript would greatly enhance the rate of contribution. Cincinnati, we have a project called iPads at Pompeii. I know we're talking about Android devices, but the example still holds. Thank you. I just realized that using the word mothballs in the title might not be the best idea, but <laughs> never mind that. It's disappeared. We have some technical problems. We have some technical problems. Oh, there you go. <sighs> it's, my, it's my PowerPoint. It's your PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> it's not a PDF, but I'm using multimedia. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. 
and we're on. So, uh, Dusting of Mothballs, introducing Duster from, I'm Jonas Kesenimi from the University of Helsinki Library, and my partner in crime is Kevin Van de Velde from Admire. And uh, uh, the idea is to, dust, uh, to link bits, bits and pieces of data uh, across time series, so, and making them available uh, through the, uh, I don't know, next. <laughs> Okay, so but but mo motivation is there's something missing. That's the actual quote. That was <laughs> that's one of the probably the absolute one of the only absolute truth truths in the world. That ev uh, only thing that it's is con is uh, constant is change from this stony guy over here. And here's uh, uh, the use case that I that I've been thinking about. So if you want to get all the articles uh, published in the Aalto University from the field of computer science. Aalto University is quite a new university. It has existed about, I don't know, a couple of years. So uh, if, you, if you don't know that it used to, uh, there used to be three universities that merged together to form the Aalto University, uh, it would help if you have some kind of model that describes that. So this is the simple model that uh, can be used to describe uh, temporal changes, and in this case, temporal changes in the, na in the name of the in the name in the universities. And uh, what the duster does, it takes uh, data from the data source modeled for example for example for example using this kind of uh, temporal uh, concepts. It it uh, takes that possibly complex data structure. Transform, transforms it into something that is very efficient to search, and, and of course it has to take into account what kind of relationships you have in the mod mod model. For example, in this case you have the, you can have something that splits, merge, merged, uh, was established, and things like that. And uh, it creates very simple solar documents, and uh, then makes it available through API. And here's an example that, uh, that uh, Kevin made. So, for example, you can you can select the the uh, one of the universities, and it automatically uh, expands it, expands the query to all of those three, plus the Alto, which is actually missing there. And finally, a couple of words for my biggest supporter. <laughs> My name is Jakub Jurkiewicz, and on behalf of my team, ICM on developers team, which consists of Tomasz Rosiek, Łukasz Wasilewicz, and, Wo and Wojtek Sylwestrzak and me, I'm presenting Intert Repository Text. We all know ad text, which was added by Google for putting commercials. What we want to do is to use this technique to add additional content to be shown to the users. We can add to ev nearly every part shown by repository some additional text. Let's say we've got keywords on page of Infona portal, which is designed by us. W usually they are uh, ordinal keywords, but if we use intertext, we've got explanation of the key keyword, which could be very useful as well. As you see, we've got this explanation for all keywords, but now we've got some keywords that are not understandable by you because they are in Polish. So then, we can give you translation. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, 
in, we've got outer names. Imagine a situation when second outer is Russian and we cannot read Cyrillic. I'm sorry for the Russian people because it's, I misuse Cyrillic, lang Cyrillic and it's not Russian, but you can see transliteration of this. So you can now re re write down it in English when you would like to cite the work. So this is what we would like to do. How we would like to do this. We got Senat project, which is consists of blocks. It, it would be repository system that would be built from blocks, like general storage, index, semantic syntax, and so on. Because this, uh, these blocks are connected like Lego bricks, because we've got basic infrastructure, now we can do this small developer challenge, which would be co uh, build the blocks that would enhance text, like block for transliteration, block for uh, block for mm, translating, block for enhancing with v Wikipedia, block for enhancing with geo names and putting map. And these blocks would be just connected to the portal, which is central part. Okay, not central, but it's which is part to the user, and then propose it. Okay, so it would be very easy, it would be very nice and show how powerful Senat is and additionally how nice would be just this enhancement. So thank you very much. Hello, I'm Ask. I'm from the State University Library. I'm a Fedora committer. And this is my idea of uh, a way we can improve the way we build uh, repository software. Basically, uh, most of the repositories we build would like uh, to have a versioning system. And most of the repositories uh, we build, we have built uh, their own versioning system. This seems somewhat redundant given that. Uh, <laughs> Um, much work has uh, been going into building uh, uniformly accepted versioning systems that we uh, ourselves use for actually developing our code. So why not have actually leverage that power? Um, and um, that is my proposal. Um, to um, use, uh, in this case, subversion um, as a backend, and in this case, for Fedora. Why would we do this? As you can see on the slide, um, there are um, several advantages. We will be able to actually check out objects, do some changes to them, and then commit them again. We will even be able to do this uh, with a number of objects. Fedora, as you might know, does not really support the checkout change and recommit uh, operation, which kind of is a, a bar in certain workflows. Um, and um, yeah, so, um, but it brings other advantages with it as well. Uh, mass processing in repositories is often a problem uh, because um, repositories tend to live as a web app. Uh, accessing a web app in mass processing is not possible. Uh, it's death. Um, so um, what we could do if the repository was really a version control system, we could check out the content into a Hadoop cluster. Um, perform whatever operation we need. If those operations change the objects, we could then recommit the objects as one change set. And um, again, you can see the slides, of course. Um, um, if we actually use a standardized backend, um, we would uh, have um, standardized tools, uh, some of which are quite nifty. GORS is a um, visualization tool um, that was actually being shown yesterday, so I can't tell you much about it. But, um, and, um, uh, the final point, we would be able to uh, browse the repository as it looked at a specific date by checking it out at a specific re revision. Something that uh, is, if it's even possible with the uh, current systems today, is not too easy. Yeah. And um, yes, I have um, developed a, a proof of concept thing that I'm going to put up on GitHub in a few days when I remove the most embarrassing bits of the, uh, <laughs> code from it. Um, just to show that you can actually 
um, do this. You can have a Fedora-like interface, um, not a total of correct in Fedora interface, but a Fedora-like interface on top of a subversion repository. Um, yeah, that's it. You go. Oh no, you haven't. Did you email it to me? Yeah. Um, oh, I see. Are we? Right. Well, I'm going to do my first slide now. Get ahead of the game. I'm Patrick McSweeney. Most of you all know me. I'm from Southampton. Hi, everybody. Um, this is my sixth one of these, by the way, and I've never won one. So you know, judges, <laughs> esteemed <laughs> judges. So. Um, <laughs> Right, okay, so what I'm here to tell you about is data engine. This is a problem, I'm going to be fast by the way. This is a problem we encountered, me and my friend Dave Mills, um, while he was doing his PhD. Uh, he was generating per experimental run one gigabyte of data. Not that much data, but more than the university said they would support, which meant that he had to do some custom workflow stuff. He then took that one gigabyte of data, um, took, threw away most of the rubbish, and had a 10 megabyte file, which he then visualized to better understand the data. What I'm suggesting is that most of the science that we do is down here in tier three, the long tail, where there's not that much data, the problems aren't that big, but there's no bloody support. So what we need is support for these people, uh, and how are we going to do that? We're going to start by importing the data straight from the scientific machines. From the scientific machine, you convert to CSV using an automatic conversion tool. In your repository workflow, you have these fields here, which allow you to say how your data set was, how your CSV data set was created from its parent data source and using what tools so that you can rerun that if you need to. Then you've got data manipulation tools which let you take the CSV files that you've created, push them into a temporary database, filter them, merge them, reduce them, as Dave was doing, into smaller CSV files and from there you can select a visualization. Uh, these are the only visualizations that I've implemented so far, but they're pretty exciting, I think you'll agree. Um, and you, <laughs> you take a visualization, there you go, you've got better understanding of your data, and of course, you store the intermediary files, you store the steps that you use to create the intermediary, intermediary CSVs, and then you store the visualization. Now, <laughs> there are a lot of visualizations that you could possibly do. This is just visualizations from the one library that I've been playing with in the last two days. The take home is, um, this is important. It's the first step on the roadmap to data si proper data science is to support these simple cases in the long tail. Um, it turns the repository into a tool which researchers are engaging from day one. The data literally goes straight in the front door and you work with it there. And you've got data goes all the way through to the visualization at the end. This means that you've got a certain amount of replayability. You can take the same source data, rerun all the scripts on it all the way through and come out with the same visualization. But more interesting than that, you can take data that looks similar, maybe you got from a similar experiment, for example, and you can run exactly identical workflow on it all the way through to the visualization at the end. And when you get to that visualization, you're comparing apples and apples because you ran exactly the same filtering steps, literally exactly the same, all the way down. And now you look at your visualization and you're comparing like with like. Ten and seconds. that is really hyper powerful. So the outlook's good. I've got quite a lot done in two days. I also did half of Matt's developer challenge for him, so that was good. Um, <laughs> if you, give me, if you ever give me an extra two days to work on this, we can get some really exciting stuff done. Maybe Matt can pay me back. Um, <laughs> So before we get this on the screen, um, I'm Peter North from the Open University. Um, it's, an, it's an iPad, but not going to work. It's not going to work? Even better. <laughs> yeah, who likes the stuff that works? What's exciting on the stuff that works? The stuff that, wor uh, that doesn't work is exciting, right? <coughs> That's true, it doesn't now. <laughs> okay, if it doesn't work, then uh, we can use the, present, uh, okay. use the presentation okay. here. No problem. <coughs> so which one was it again? Um, uh, the number seven. Uh, uh, J-Mobile. Huh? I sent it to you. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, where was it? Uh, <coughs> which 
Which one? <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Not this one. Sorry. <laughs> Is that it? That's it. That's it? Yep. Brilliant. Okay, that's great. So... <laughs> Sorry. Fantastic. Okay, so I would like to pitch an idea of a mobile application for searching across repositories. Imagine the world if you, if you were, let's say, a researcher or a student or anybody interested in accessing content and you would like, you would have a, an application that would provide you access to anything across repositories. You wouldn't care about, uh, about the repository in which the content is stored in. You would just search and you would get it. You would be able to explore the content in those repositories using these apps. And these apps would be provided in, uh, for Apple devices. It, they would be provided also for Android devices. And basically, these apps are available. I encourage you to go to the store and download them now. <coughs> How can we do this bloody difficult thing? So we have APIs, right? And, the, and basically, building these applications that's pretty easy when we have these APIs. And we can use an aggregation systems like, like Core because uh, they provide APIs and these APIs are our friends. We can perhaps use even Microsoft Academic Search API <laughs> if there weren't these restrictions, right? <laughs> we could use them. And the idea of this mobile app is that, well, I'm going to that. Innovation, it's a novel app. It doesn't exist. It has the vision is that papers, your papers are everywhere. You can share the papers then. You can synchronize papers so you can have them on your laptop. You can have them everywhere. The, the app provides this. It's, this is an abbreviation which I invented. It says, what you find is what you download. <laughs> and gadgets are cool. Who, I love them, <laughs> right? And that's it. Usability, even your grandma can use it. It's three clicks. You search, you download, you get it, you read it. It's done, you know? <laughs> what, what else do you want to develop? And functionality, I think it's great. You just have to go there and try it. And you say audience. And I'm sorry, but we are not supporting these devices. <laughs> You're using your own, yeah? Have you got these apps now? No, no, I need your own. Sorry, sorry. Come on, you. You can't just talk in for it. Even John. Okay, uh, hello, uh, we are uh, Richard and Mark from Cottage Labs, and um, we're here today to try to present something to you called Sordid. So um, I'm also a, a PhD student here at Edinburgh, and uh, from the perspective of being a PhD student, I don't actually know anything about repositories. I might do from Cottage Labs, right, but that's irrelevant. So I'm here, I'm doing some research, and hey, I don't know anything about where my paper goes, why I should put it in the local repository, what the local repository is, even does it exist. I just don't know, I don't care, maybe I should, but there you go. So um, <laughs> what can we do to change this, right? How can we get researchers like me in future closer to the repository? How are we going to make it so that I want to bother putting something in this thing that I don't even know about right now? Uh, how are we going to do that? How are we going to bring the information from the repository back to somewhere I do care about? So on with Richard. OK, so the answer to this question is a combination of something we've written this week called Sordit and another piece of software that we've been working on before called Facet View. So I'm going to tell you very quickly about Sordit, which is the code we wrote this week. Um, basically, it's a jQuery plugin 
uh, that's designed to be just dropped onto a web page and immediately give it sword deposit functionality, right? So you can drop this thing straight onto a department web page or a researcher's web page. So Mark's web page can immediately be annotated with sword deposit functionality. You could drop it into your repository's discovery user interface. You could drop it into your research information system. You could drop it into your library catalog. And to do that, all you need is this one line of JavaScript in the headers of your HTML page, and you've got a sword integration with that page to your repository. Okay, but it doesn't stop there, right? You can do more cool stuff. If you turn this into a Grease Monkey plugin, which we haven't yet done, you could attach these deposit buttons to any web page. So you could be browsing on Web of Science, you could enable your sword it deposit button, and you'd be able to deposit your publications with the metadata from the Web of Science straight into your repository. You could do the same thing with Google search results if you wanted to. You could go from any web page, you can deposit any web page, you can deposit any file on any web page. And uh, here's some examples of how it might look. Look, here's the Web of Science, but, uh, or Web of Knowledge, and I've logged in, and I've enabled my Sordit plugin, and, uh, and there's the button to let me deposit it into the repository. And there's the Google search results, exactly the same deal. I can just drop it straight into my repository. So let us give you a quick example of it actually working. All right, so um, I'll, I'll explain a bit, uh, a little bit about why this example might, might uh, exist, right? Because um, we've got this on a web page here running from the one piece of JavaScript that Richard shows you. Unfortunately, we can't show it on an informatics web page because in typical researcher style, I forgot my uh, login to the SSH server. <laughs> so it, it's on our own web page at the moment, but Richard will explain to you here how we can do this. Yeah. Okay, so this, this is a publication record. I've just clicked on the sort it button and it's opened up a little web page. It's scraped the metadata out of the HTML and put, them in, put it in a metadata editing form. I've just added a file from my local desktop. And now I'm going to hit upload, right? And now immediately I can go and visit that fi file which is in my repository already with the metadata and the file I just uploaded. And the reason that I might want to bother doing this is because in the same JavaScript line, I can now embed on my own web page information about, the, say, the articles I've published, the things my research group have published, and then show them off. That's it. You want to do that one first? going to be a browser. Yes. It's already loaded. Don't worry, I'll be extra quick for everyone, if it ever appears. Uh, yeah. So try the other one. Oh, another one. Got a voice screen here at the minute. Yeah. Should I take this out? Yeah. I think the laptop may have died. Cameron Nayland came up to me yesterday, and or the day before, I forget, it's been a long couple of days, and he proposed this. There are lots of people putting in papers into larger, well-known repositories, PubMed, etc., but they're also putting into publishers, and they're all getting DOIs. But how, how can you actually know who can see your paper? There are the libraries, they buy bundles of subscriptions. They don't buy individual journals, not unless they're really pressed. They get the the bundles from the suppliers, and so how can you tell which libraries have access to your papers? So I spent the last day building a survey tool, which you might be able to see, but it's a, it is now running at isthisresearchreadable.org, and it's live, you can go and do it. Um, the Crossref people have a service which is broken at the moment, but it can give you random DOIs. So what I'm proposing is out of the 39 million DOIs, we take a relevant sample of 66,000 records, DOIs, and look them up. That will give us a 99% uh, uh, confidence level that our sample, sample will match the overall spread. And from that, we can tell 
how many people can actually see this because we'll ask people to come along. Can you see the abstract? Can you get the PDF? If you can't get the PDF, how much does that paywall cost? And if you can find it elsewhere in an open repository, for them to add the link in so that we can find it automatically. So those with you, those with your browsers open, is this researchreadable.org, and it's there and live. I just need the actual DOIs from Crossref, and their service is broken. So we might have the machine running by the uh, time I finish. To restart. So <laughs> just to finish with, my name is Ben Osteen, and this was actually whatever the talk was at the end. So I'm I'm dropping one of my talks to save you all time because we're running run out, running out. Thank you. Good night. In order for Mahendra to save his machine, I'm going to cut in because I've got a working machine. Now that's that's still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course I can. I had it in my browser just now. Thank you. Pull that for a second. Hang it's detecting it. Yeah. Should go up now. Boom. Excellent. Do you want, is this research readable? Okay, if you scroll down a bit. Brilliant. So it's already tallying up stuff. I've faked the numbers. If you scroll down even more, you can see a rather large link. Try a random DOI if you could quickly. I don't want to take up much time. Okay, so it's picked a random DOI. You click on it. Don't need to yet. Um, click on it. And you've got to find, does this link actually go anywhere? Because there's lots of broken DOIs out there. You'll find out, can you get to the splash page? Can you read the article? Come back to that page, fill in your box. If you go to location and type in Edin B or something like that, uh, because I'm tying into Ian Stewart's ORI list of institutions. So it will do a search on his service. If you just go there and type in something. Yeah, just wait a second. It takes a little while. Um, but this is trying to cut down on the number of institutions that get put in the box because obviously dissemination will be a bit of a problem. Um, and you can just pick from the list. Uh, but yeah, fill in the links, hit submit, and uh, there you go. Cheers, Ben. Thanks. So I'll cut in while Mahindra's still booting. So this is presentation 18 near the end, but since it's a demo, I'll just quickly cut in. Um, how many people have seen me give one of these before? Slightly crazy, slightly mad. Happenings are about to happen, most likely, if I can get it all working. Um, so last year, I did depositing into a repository using a Connect. Basically, I didn't touch the laptop. This year, unfortunately, I'm going to touch the laptop. Sorry about that. And I thought I'd go for something less brave. So I thought I'd just go for a time machine. I thought that was much less brave than throwing things into a repository using Connect. Um, but uh, not quite for everything, for linked data. Okay. Because typically we're publishing linked data on the web in this kind of form, right? Triples. Okay? There's a simple triple. Okay? But we know nothing about this triple, like the who, the what, the where, the when, the business published, that kind of information, because typically those, those things just aren't existing. People aren't publishing this type of information. For people who know about linked data and named graphs, I'm sure you can fill the gaps, okay? Because there's a lot in this. But why aren't people publishing this information, even using the available technology? Uh, and available uh, methods is because, you know, slightly lazy, maybe, <laughs> okay? But again, technology can actually solve half the problem for you, so why doesn't that technology exist? Um, well, it does, and I have basically created this thing called LDS3, Linked Data Simple Storage Specification, which does the hard work for you. It's very sword, it's very crud. I believe that's a band, actually, with that CRUD logo. Very Dublin Core, very Amazon. So it's borrowing a load of stuff and kind of mashing it together. Um, but so what I want to actually do is give you a demo of it. And I just need to move that to there. Uh, so I want to give you a demo of it. So in my browser, hopefully you can see this when the screen comes back. Um, so in this tab, this is a document I've submitted. Uh, it's a bit complex because I haven't really prettified it. I'm sorry about that. But this is a standard uh, RDF triples display library you can get out there called Graphite. Uh, and what I've actually done here is I've, I've submitted a person called Bob and Sue. This document's describing Bob and Sue. And this is the document and, and who submitted it. But the, all of that information is actually some provided by the, the, this, doc, this endpoint. So when you submit it, it's all annotated. This document gets annotated by the endpoint. And it adds a, a, a significant thing called date submitted, right? So you know when it was submitted and what it's a version of and what it replaces, right? So it's very sorty. It links everything together with provenance information. 
Now let's get to the cool bit. What can we actually do with this? What pretty interface can we actually put on top of it? Well, if you see this little button over here, you can go view doc history. Who's got an Apple computer? I can see plenty of them in the room, so you might have seen this interface before. It's a time machine for linked data, so you can just browse through it, so you can see the history of this object through time. And cooler than that, so what you can do is if you click on one of these, it brings it up in the interface, and you'll be able to restore it and do cool things with documents, so we can browse things through time. Okay, So yeah, a bit techy, but quite cool. But what else does this mean? What else does this mean? Well, come on projector. It means what we want to get to is the semantic web. It's the final frontier. Okay, so we want to do this, this kind of query. How many countries? <laughs> give me, give me one, one slide. Give me how many countries have a capital city with airport with population over two million? That's a hard query to answer in linked data. Even harder if you want to do that on the 23rd of July 2006. But we can do this with this because we can rebuild the data as it looked. We can do it using Memento. So that's what I'm proposing. Time travel for linked data, not just time travel for static web resources, dynamic web resources. It's the final frontier. Okay. Uh, Les, next. Les. Um, I've got it working if you need it. It just crashed, so. Oh, and uh, which one was it? You put mine up. Yeah, uh, which one was it again? What did you call it? Uh, well, it's called, it starts off number 10, pitch okay. poster. Right, so folks, well, something happened to me this year. They took my repository away from me. The librarians came, and they, I've, I've been running this repository for our researchers for um, uh, since uh, uh, 2002. And uh, I'm no longer a repository manager. Uh, and so now I have to spend my time uh, as a researcher. And one of the things I've discovered that's happening in, to research at the moment is we're, we're having to make a lot of account of ourselves back to our funders and say, oh, this brilliant thing happened, or this piece of impact happened, or there's this fantastic outcome. And, um, and I found there's a piece of, uh, of technology missing that I really need. And I keep going for that, and it's not there. And I keep saying to my, say to my admin assistant, oh, no, if only we, we, could, we could do something. We, we need to... Anyway, I'll tell you about that. And this is what this is all about. Last month, one of my PhD students tweeted this. Um, and it was about something that he'd just done. He'd just won a prize for uh, a, a piece of work that he put into a, a competition run by the World Bank. And he tweeted about it. And the tweet had a link to the home page of the World Bank, which had a picture of him up there looking all proud. Uh, winning this international competition uh, and uh, there was the competition page from the World Bank uh, and so we released a press release about it and we told the EPSRC and they went oh fantastic and they released a press release about it so there was lots of dissemination going on some of which had been planned in advance in case he won uh, and, uh, uh, and so it all went on the web now the problem with that is it's all starting to dissipate and get replaced it just the next day stuff happens you know you, your, your diary comes in your email comes in everything just kind of disappears and of course it's not on the front page of the web of the World Bank's web page anymore and next year it won't even be on their competition because someone else will have won it if it's an annual competition so it just dissipates and what I keep saying to uh, my, my, th these people is go, let's capture that quick. Let's write about it. We need to, we need to remember that for when we come in two years' time to write up the final report and send it off to the EPSRC. We need to say, remember that? That was fantastic. But there's, it just, it, ugh, it just all gets lost. So this is what we want to do. Uh, we want to capture the imagination, the inspiration while it happens. Now there are bits of software that do bits of this, and I just want to put some of them together. Uh, so there's something, uh, how many of you have got the app called Path? Um, it's a brilliant thing for doing stuff like, t by, like Twitter, but it has a little interface on it that lets you, sit, rather than actually typing in people's names and looking them up, lets you say, you know, so you press on a button and you choose who, where, what, why, you know, you choose, you know, so we can tie this up to sources of open data, uh, perhaps even the Microsoft Academic Live API, who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and we can we can capture this uh, and send it out to the repositories. So that's it. Boaster. 
for, for showing off. Yes, uh, hello, I'm Asuka, uh, still, and I'm still Danish, and I'm still here, so um, welcome back. Um, I'm going to talk about a little some. actually, let me tell you a story. Um, I arrived Monday morning uh, preparing uh, for my developer challenge, the uh, subversion repositories, and uh, I was talking to Frank Asik, and he said, yeah, that's nifty, but what I w would really like is Fedora object locking. I think, is it? yeah, but that's easy. That, um, I could do that before lunch. Well, I had a prototype before lunch. I've been refining it since then. But um, basically, what it is, um, it allows for uh, multiple Fedora web apps to um, sync to um, not write the same objects at the same time. Um, and this is one, uh, and this is an important step uh, towards actually having multiple Fedora web apps accessing the same object store. Um, and it uh, is in a working prototype now that people can play with. It's on GitHub, uh, read the address. So I'm blinking uh, on GitHub, find me. Um, uh, but why would we wo uh, want this? Yes, as you can read. Um, um, Frank is um, working, or has even finished, I don't know, a uh, way to use uh, have the Fedora object store stored in a uh, Hadoop file system. Um, that's fine. Um, um, but um, it's still a kind of a bottleneck. If you have one web app, you might have a lot of data nodes, but you have one web app. Everything has to go through that if you want to go through the Fedora um, interface. So why not have multiple Fedora uh, heads, as I call them? Um, and actually, yeah, we can go further, uh, but I won't because that's uh, out of time. But um, what I've been doing is uh, I'm using uh, Hazelcast, a nifty little, uh, a little a nifty big framework suggested to me by Chris Wilber. Um, I've uh, added two new uh, me REST methods for Fedora, lock and unlock. And I added a decorator, which is a Fedora plugin, that um, uh, uh, this allows access, uh, uh, writing access to an object while it is uh, locked. Um, so um, to use this, you have to add three uh, lines to one uh, of the config files, and you have to add three lines to one of the other config files, and you have to dump the jar file on the class path. And you have Fedora object locking. That's what I <laughs> You've got no Okay, so I have a proposal which has a name. But first, let's talk about Sword. It's great, but just for deposit. It has limitations. With Sword 2, you can edit the content that you deposit. But to do that, you get edit IRIs returned as you deposit. And they're your receipt to be able to do anything with that content. What happens if you forget that edit IRI? Your system doesn't save it. What if you want to administer content that you've already got in your repository and just change that content? Um, yeah. So sword could be more widely used if the edit IRIs were discoverable. So a proposal. I want an atom feed. Now, I want it to support authentication. At a basic level, this can be used as a better replacement for our IIPMH, because we can do things like hiding dark items and just retrieving them when you pass the authentication. But I want more. I want it to return the non-complete, the non-archived items as well, things that you may have deposited in the past with S.W.O.R.D., as long as you've got rights to edit them. Most importantly, I want it to return the edit IRIs. 
so that I can actually do work with those items. So I said I had a name. Well, I'm going to summarize. What I want is a simple harvest interface <laughs> for edit link discovery. Jimmy Tang here. Numbers got mixed up, sorry. Did you email it to me? I did, yeah. And what did you call it? Uh, my name is Jimmy Tang. I'm based in Dublin from Ireland. And oh, <laughs> uh, how do I? Sorry about this. Uh, um, just rotate. Top, top. I didn't expect this. So uh, what I wanted to talk about today was, uh, with my pitch that I wanted to put forward, was uh, to talk about redundancy at the file and network level to uh, protect data. One of the main problems that, um, if I go next. <laughs> so the, the problem is, uh, that I'm trying to tackle <laughs> is Acrobat. And people with uh, multi-terabyte archives uh, in the order of tens to the hundreds of terabytes. And what people tend to like to do is when they've got valuable data is they like to protect it. And the easiest way of protecting data is to make copies of it. And every time when you make a copy of it, you pay for that copy of that data. So I'm cheap. I like to make the most of what I, whatever I buy. So I don't think that uh, replicating data is a, very good, is, is a very good idea. And it's very wasteful. So you have to pay for maintaining an additional machines. You have to pay for additional power, additional networking, and possibly even uh, additional people to maintain your, uh, your infrastructure. So what I would like to propose is uh, to try and encourage people to move away from relying on the, ho the whole concept of trying to keep lots of copies of, uh, of data to keep it safe. Uh, there are alternatives out there to try and uh, reduce the need for having multiple copies dotted around the place. Um, one of the possible solutions is uh, using uh, forward error correcting codes or erasure codes. And for anybody who's uh, set up a RAID system before on a single machine, um, it's basically the same con concept. You uh, have a, uh, you basically take a file, you chop it up into lots of little bits, and you add it a little bit of redundancy to that uh, to to that set of files, and then you spread it out. And if you lose one piece of the file, you can still reconstruct the data set. And the idea is that uh, it's, it's to move that type of uh, feature and functionality from the, from the hardware into, the, in, 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 into the, the software world to, to try and reduce cost of total ownership of actually owning expensive hardware and owning expensive multiple copies of that hardware to, do, uh, to keep, your cop to keep uh, multiple copies of your, of, of your data. OK. Um, so that's basically what I'm trying to push. And I had a look at uh, possible ways of actually doing this. And there are some open source libraries out there to do erasure coding uh, in software. So it's possible to apply some of these ideas. And most of them are just mashups. Thanks. Uh, so we've got our. Um Jose? Did you email it to me? Sorry? Did you email the presentation? Yes. What was it called? It was Tesla. Well, uh, good.
Good afternoon, all. My name is Jose Martin. I come from the University of London Computer Center from the Digital <coughs> Archives and Repositories team. And I am proposing a machine and user-friendly policy finding that is uh, a way to uh, embed information retrieved from Sherpa Romeo uh, APIs, uh, web services uh, with their policy information into records that are uh, waiting to be reviewed in our repository. Um, last uh, um, Monday during dinner, um, uh, Azar Hussein from Sherpa Romeo explained to well those of us of us that were close to him, <laughs> how uh, Sherpa Romeo web services that offer their uh, policy information to all repositories and CRISP platforms and everything, uh, receive on a daily basis over 250,000 requests. So he was uh, aiming to get from the, the repository world some kind of scripts or tools that would uh, make that um, process more efficient. So he was thinking of some, some kind of um, uh, script that could be run on a daily or nightly basis and do that same thing in a more efficient way. Uh, besides, this um, task is usually accomplished by repository uh, managers manually in a quite um, you know, an adventurous way. So why not let's better put machines at work instead? So we have here a sample repository and it prints one with uh, 10 submitted items pending to be reviewed. We have downloaded the uh, XML information from the Sherpa Romeo web services. Uh, we have, among some other data, we have the, uh, according to the ISSN, uh, the Romeo color code, which, gi which gives a hint about the policy uh, profile. So we run our script. It would go through the 10 items we had pending uh, to be reviewed and try and f uh, find a match using the ISSN and uh, retrieve the proper uh, Romeo color code. So that would let us change this into this. So um, probably a you know, repository administrator would be uh, glad to start his working day in a more colorful way <laughs> and have all this already done for him or her. And so we have added a Romeo color uh, field for every record and we display them accordingly. So the idea is that um, uh, uh, that updated uh, policy information will be retrieved in just a single request, a longer one, but just one, and just before running the script. And that would uh, make machines more efficient. And so that's the machine friendly part. And uh, repository administrators and Sherpa Romeo staff uh, happier, that's a friendly type, and we also retrieve the journal title, so well, thank you. Okay, so I would like to introduce an application called Repository Analytics. Um, now, uh, it's an application that will make lives of repository managers very easy. Um, repository managers need to know if their metadata and content are, is being harvested and if everything is correct with their, with their system. Uh, the problem is that they can't really they can't discover it. It's very difficult for them to, to realize uh, if everything is correct with their system because they would need some testing tools. So it's, it's good if somebody can check from the outside. Repository analytics is a tool which lists open access repositories, the content uh, of which uh, some aggregation tool is harvesting. And um, they can be used uh, by um, repository managers to check, for example, that uh, metadata are being harvested correctly, how much metadata uh, have been harvested, and if everything is OK. If um, it also provides, uh, I know that there have been similar tools in a sense, but um, this tool is different because it uh, provides also access to, it also provides statistics on the content, not only on the metadata. So it also provides information about harvesting of the full text PDF files, which is extremely important. And uh, even though we have OAIPMH, 
Um, in fact, there are huge discrepancies between the, uh, among the systems, and therefore it's really necessary that we have some kind of analytical tools. So uh, now imagine that I'm a repository manager uh, of this repository, and I can see that everything is fine. I can see uh, when uh, the harvests have been carried out, and I am also able to, uh, and because everything is fine, I get a star. You know, and that makes me happy, definitely. Uh, now imagine that, let's blame somebody, so uh, let's blame Bristol. <laughs> I hope don't, nobody is here from Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry for that. And uh, Bristol, you know, um, their metadata harvesting system doesn't work very well. Their OAIP MH endpoint uh, produces errors, and because I'm a repository manager, I can see it now. Now imagine that everything is fine with your uh, repository system, but we, for some reason, from your tick, you suddenly get a cross. So we can send, what I propose is we can send a notification to the repository manager and the repository manager can act and do something interesting about that. What repository man, uh, analytics also should provide is our certain statistics, statistics on the accesses to content, statistics on the amounts of PDF files that you can actually harvest from the repository. Because, you know, why do we have repositories when we can't access the PDF content? Why do we always calculate statistics on metadata? Why don't we take into account the PDF files? And that's much more important. So um, that's pretty much it. That's the application. This is just the start. We want to produce a lot of other interesting um, statistics on the PDF level, uh, on, sorry, on the full text level. For example, information about citations across repositories. Thank you very much. like to propose an idea that would hopefully move institutions one step closer to their goal of this perfect uh, current research information system that has all your metadata and it's very complete, it's very nice and it's structured and it's all there. Um, but the fact today is that researchers don't really care about the metadata about the publication. They care about the publication. They care about the publication list, but they don't really want to burden themselves with entering the metadata about the publication. Librarians care about metadata. We as developers care about metadata. Institutions care about metadata because they can use that to assess research. In many cases, the metadata about the publications are available to us in our uh, library catalog or discovery uh, interface. So. If we're a bit clever and we query our discovery interface for new publications from our own institution, we can hopefully extract this metadata, inject it into our uh, research, research information system, um, have librarians who love metadata annotate, complete, perfect, uh, correct this metadata along the way, and we will obtain this excellent research information system um, question, can we do this? Can we implement this? Uh, in fact, uh, we have done it uh, between our own uh, discovery interface and our own Chris. Um, we have done it again since we changed the Chris. We'll do it again in short time because we're changing this, this, the discovery interface. Um, what we would like was to extract all this work we've done. And why are we doing it again and again and again? mainly because the Chris and to some extent the discovery interface is not open, does not lend itself to extracting and injecting and creating new records based on external metadata. So in some sense, we're calling for help from Chris developers, from discovery interface developers to, to open uh, the interfaces, open the metadata. Uh, and by doing this, they can help us extract a, a generic solution that will enable movement of metadata from discovery to the Chris. That's it.
you. So next is Julie. Hello, uh, I'm Julie Allison. I work for the University of York. Um, I've, I've come up with this idea with Ben Osteen, who has lots of great ideas. Um, this is about uh, visualising repositories in the real world. So this is the pitch. Um, we'd like to use uh, .NET Gazetteer or Arduino or something similar to visualise repository activity. Um, and on the other side of this, in, in a more online way, we'd like to look at using free tools to visualise repository content. Why? For lots of reasons. Uh, for publicity, to demonstrate potential, to show things in the real world that, that come from the virtual world, and, and, and to demonstrate some really usefulness. Um, how, would we, how do we want to do this? There's a, a variety of ideas. We've not been able to develop many because we haven't got a .NET gadget here, and we'd love one. Um, so some of the ideas are um, an always-on LCD readout of the current health of the repository, so uh, a little screen that, that, that would tell us if there was something going wrong, it would tell us when th things were going into the repository, it would tell us about downloads. Uh, we'd have a physical gauge that would, that would go up and, and show us um, hits per hour so we could see progress, and it, it, it would be a really good demonstration tool showing people things. Uh, like a sculpture for the, the repository, something real. Um, we'd have a, a, an actual bell that would ring when we met our deposits per day target, and, and we'd, we'd even look at uh, blowing <coughs> bubbles for each deposit. Um, and then I, I got to thinking about 3D printing, and we could start actually printing the objects deposited into the repository in a 3D way. Um, on the other side, online, uh, uh, some of the tools that I thought were interesting were ChronoZoom, so that's a timelining tool, so we could show repository contents across a, a really interactive timeline. Pivot View is a way of, um, particularly image content would be brilliant for this, it, it allows ways of uh, pivoting around content and, and navigating. And then um, the JavaScript info viz is a set of uh, visualization tools. Um, the repository would be mine, uh, York Digital Library. Uh, these are some of, the, some of the ways we can already start getting at the data. It's got, it's got a standard query, uh, Fedora query interface, so we could get things like creation date uh, information, uh, RDF and XML data streams can be gotten by the API. We also have Google Analytics, so we can, we can get the statistics through the Google Analytics APIs. Very, very quick demo, because I thought I ought to do something rather than just talk about it. Um, this is just an example of the sort of thing you can do with RDF data. Uh, this is a bit of hacked JSON um, showing you, you can bounce around these uh, these networks, so you can you navigate networks and links between objects, um, which I thought was really neat. And I'll just do it again because I like it because it bounces when you do it. Um, so thank you very much. I've come in 15 seconds under time. Right, we all want to go out of here, so I'll be quick. We have lots of repositories which have got one repository manager, no developers. They have some support, but they don't really have any, so we're going to RAM raid them. We're going to have a VM set up with either a Fedora backend or a data bank with lots of microservices. We're going to get all the lovely content, pull it in there, and run text analysis, text mining, image analysis, face detection, uh, lookups on RDF link, and enhance it. And if the repository manager can then go to our boss and go, here, I've got this data. Why can't we do this? We just need a bit of extra money. And we can sell that as a PR tool. And so you'll spend maybe 20 quid to spin up a VM for a month as a demo for this. But you'll be able to get all the tools and do it quickly. But we're going to ram raid, but with permission. Thank you. Interesting. Okay, um, now that was the last presentation, so a round of applause for everyone.
you want to just give a quick feedback on the applause meter? Okay, um, so um, I'm not exact. I can't get the whole page on a screen. So um, this is this is this is the order in which people gave their presentations. Okay, if you could find a little piece of paper, and I'm going to just go through all the all the presentations there, so you'll know the number to associate with. All I need from you is a piece of paper with a number on. If you could. Uh, leave it, there should be a box, Wait, is it, there's a box there, okay, as you leave, could you uh, give it to the assistants who are wearing OR 12, 2012 t-shirts, um, and, sorry, teams can't vote for, e for anything, okay, so, uh, so, uh, and, and please take your beer bottles, that's really important, we kind of, we're, we're not normally allowed to bring drink in here, so please take your beer bottles with you, okay? So uh, that's the first eight. Yeah, okay, number one, yeah, was Splinter by Matt Taylor. Please. In the number. <laughs> okay, number two, Mobile Audio Transcription and Submission, Keith Gilbertson and Linda Newman. Could you stand up, please? Okay. Uh, three, Dusting Off the Mothballs, Eunice and Kevin. Okay, inter-repository text, to, uh, Jakub. It's inter-text. Inter-text, uh, inter sorry. Uh, number five, repository-based version control systems, Aska. The presentation without Carla. Okay, number six, remember to put the line underneath if you choose this one, is Data Engine by Patrick McSweeney. <laughs> 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 Number seven is cross-repository mobile application. Uh, it's Peter. Can you stand up, please? So we can see. Okay. Uh, number, got lost. Hang on. Uh, number eight, getting academics closer to repositories. That's Richard and Mark. Okay. Uh, number nine is uh, Ben Osteen and Cameron Nalen. Is this research readable? Okay, it's Ben. Um, uh, next is, uh, I'm getting lost here, uh, A Thing of Dreams, A Time Machine, Dave Tarrant, at the back there. Um, you've got number 10, though. You've read, you've read done the numbers. I've read done the numbers. Okay, no, no, no. Um, uh, number 11 is Boaster, Les Carr. Les? Okay, okay. Uh, Number 12 is Fedora Object Locking, that's Asker again. Okay, Shield, number 13, Graham Trigg. Just standing there. Um, 14 is Redundancy at the file and network level to protect data, that's Jimmy Tang. Uh, 15, Machine and User-Friendly Policifying, Jose Martin. Number 16 is Repository Analytics, that's, that's Peter again. Uh, 17, Linking Chris's to Research Discovery, that's Stefan and his team. Do you want to stand up? Um, and uh, 18 is visualizing repositories in the real world. That's Julie Allenson and Ben Osteen. And finally, repository RAM rate, Ben Osteen. Okay, I'll leave these up, kind of. Uh, no, no, no. Yep, yeah, just leave it there. Yeah. How can I get to Yeah, I tried that, but it was too small. Uh, 